A reading from Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, Aramean of Padaram, sister of Laban, of Aramean of Padaram. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided, and the one shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. And what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Our story from Genesis today gives us insight into the first family of Israel. And the family dynamics are, well, explosive. Now, the word from the Greek dunamis is what yields our English word dynamite. Dynamite is that explosive compound, you know, invented by Alfred Nobel the Swedish chemist and engineer, had tried and experimented with a number of different elements to stabilize the very volatile nitroglycerin that is at the core of, of what came to be known as dynamite. But time after time, these experiments ended in premature explosions, one of which took the life of his brother along with 15 others. Finally, he arrived at the solution of using common clay to stabilize the, the uh, mixture, and it came to be known as dynamite. And while it was primarily used early on in mining application for road work and things of that nature, it came to be used increasingly for military applications, intentionally taking the lives of human beings. Some years later, after the unrelated death of his other brother, Ludwig, uh, the newspaper wrote an obituary and confused the two brothers, writing the obituary about Alfred. So he got to read his own obituary, and he found this disturbing sentence about Nobel being a man who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before. That led him to donate his fortune to rewarding those who promote life and peace instead. Families are powerful elements of society that can be stabilizing agents, and yet they are often powder kegs waiting to explode. The good news is that God can and does use those family dynamics for peaceful good. It's hard to say 
whether the narrator of this story intended to see the problem in this family starting with the parents, but that's the natural reading of things uh, because we are told right off that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah Jacob. It's not hard to imagine this, sadly, as too many of people grow up in families where they feel that one parent favors one child and the other compensates, right, by favoring the other. The resulting sibling rivalry can be explosive. But then we're told that Rebecca had an encounter with God while she was pregnant with twins. God told her that the struggle she was experiencing in her womb foretold the story of the boys that would follow. And this seems to have justified the parents' choices and puts the blame squarely on God for it all. More on that later. Now, of course, I know nothing about what it's like to carry a child or deal with morning sickness over it, not to mention twins kicking in your womb. Some of you do know, and I imagine some of you were probably talking to God more than usual during your pregnancies. My New York daughter, Jillian, is sick with child right now. So you you see what I did there? (laughs) Just slipped in that announcement that Kim and I are going to have our fifth grandchild um, early February. Uh, We don't know whether it's a boy or a girl yet, but okay, so just now you know. So far, Jillian has not experienced... Uh, any private conversations with God that she has told us about to tip us off about this child in the womb, but maybe some of you have had such a thing happen that gave you a hint of what was to come, or when you look back on it, well, you know. Now, Now, naming children is also a big deal, you understand, and it was in our family as the kids were growing up. We had ongoing conversations about this from the time our kids were little. Okay, Rhett, sort of, not as much, but there were lists that were hung on the wall, and they were updated constantly, scratched out, priorities moved up and down, arguments over whose name would be whose, and that sort of thing. It was sort of a parlor game we all joined in for years. We passed the miles in the car on road trips as a family, talking about names, naming the kids. It was fun until it became real. And then Kim and I learned that the job of would-be grandparents is pretty much to to stay out of that, (laughs) or at least to say how much we love whatever name they suggest. No easy task for Kim, don't you know? (laughs) Really. Names are a big deal in the Bible, too. Isaac's name, for example, means son of laughter. And it goes back to that story in the Bible when Sarah laughed, when she learned that she was going to have a child when she was 90 years old. Who would laugh, right? Isaac, son of laughter, wasn't a joke exactly, but he was no heroic figure either. He was mostly a passive, transitional figure moving the story forward among the patriarchs. First, by being the boy who, how did he do this? Allowed himself to be tied down by his father on an altar to be sacrificed to God until, thank God, an angel came and stayed his father's hand. Right? This is the dim-witted father, uh, Isaac, who preferred... Esau to Jacob just so he could enjoy venison. And finally, this is the man who allowed himself to be tricked into giving his blessing to Jacob rather than Esau. If he wasn't a joke himself, the joke was often on him. Now Esau was named Esau because when he came out first, he was hairy. That's what Esau means, hairy. He ended up being a hunter, and Daddy loved the game he came home with. Rebecca had a different game in mind. 
When Jacob came out, he was smooth. Turned out to be a smooth operator too. They named him Jacob because it means heel. And that's probably because he was grabbing for Esau's heel as Esau was trying to get out first and he wanted to be first and pull him back in. And in the Hebrew, Jacob for heel has the same ambiguity that it does in the English language. That is, heel can also mean, well, you know, trickster, usurper, supplanter, the guy who's always looking out for himself first. And Rebecca enabled him, justifying it as divine mandate. In this story, Jacob cons his brother out of his birthright. Now, as the older brother in that culture, Esau would have been entitled to two-thirds of his father's estate, Jacob only one-third. So Jacob seizes his moment, no doubt with the aid of his scheming mother, and when Esau comes in from hunting unsuccessfully, he is famished. Jacob has prepared his State Fair award-winning five-alarm Texas chili. (laughs) Or something like that. Give me some of that red stuff, Esau says. Hardly a foodie, that Esau. (laughs) You know. Now, I don't know if you've learned this, but I have learned that it's best not to go grocery shopping when you are desperately hungry. get twice as much stuff and all that. You know, a few years ago, the comedian Tina Fey did a commercial where she was standing in the grocery store checkout line, right? And uh, she just couldn't stand it any longer. She was so hungry, she reached out and grabbed for a bag of potato chips and opened them up and just started stuffing them in her mouth, eating these potato chips until she realized it was actually potpourri. (laughs) Yummy. Well, Esau would have done just about anything for that stew. Jacob made a deal with him he couldn't refuse. So Esau sold his birthright for a mess of pottage, as the old King James put it, right? A mess of pottage. And my, my, the mess that followed. Esau would have to live for the rest of his life with the smell of that stew in his nostrils humiliation over and over. And Jacob too, because this set off an explosive chain of events that took a lifetime to resolve, especially if you read on, you can see. See, Jacob wouldn't settle for just Esau's birthright. He and his mother then conspired to steal his father's blessing from Esau too, which meant that the power of procreation and prosperity would pass primarily to Jacob and not to Esau. More on that next week. Timothy will help you with that. Well, the boys became enemies from that moment on, and even after some reconciliation, their posterity has remained at odds. Esau, you understand, grew up to be the father of the Edomites who lived across the Jordan in what is modern-day Jordan, actually. And Jacob became Israel, and Israel and Jordan are still at odds today even as they were in biblical times. And yet, and yet, we are told that God chose Jacob and not Esau. This offends our moral sensibilities, doesn't it? Not that Esau was any paragon of virtue, mind you. He was entirely uncaring about important things. Seemed preoccupied with his hobbies and his hungers. So, don't be like Esau. Well, what a world-class cad Jacob was. Don't be like Jacob. Uh, And then there's Isaac and Rebekah. Don't be like them either. And yet, God uses this family 
to bring salvation to the world? Go figure. So, St. Augustine in the 5th century figured it this way. He saw God choosing Jacob and not Esau as a typology of salvation by grace alone, not of works. It was precisely because Jacob was so undeserving that he became the father of faith, Augustine said. Grace brings about virtue, not the other way around, and there's something to that. But then Augustine went on to say that the story of God's foretelling all this to Rebecca reveals the doctrine of predestination. In other words, it's all about God and not us, divine grace and not human merit, and if so, then God must have determined it all beforehand, which means God chose some of us in Jacob to be saved and the rest of us in Esau to be damned. And that, my friends, is a damnable and destructive theological claim. It has infected the church ever since and continues to be a kind of dynamite that blows to bits the world into the saved and the lost, the blessed and the cursed, the insider and the outsider. It's the same dynamic that keeps churches trying to decide who gets to be a member and who doesn't, who gets to be part of the family of God and who doesn't, who gets to eat at the Lord's table and who doesn't. Goodness, what a mess of pottage. Where Augustine went wrong was this. God's choosing Jacob rather than Esau was not about election for salvation, but election for mission. Instead of authorizing the church to proclaim a whole new world of discrimination, it was meant to do just the opposite. By choosing the second child, God was exploding, overturning the world's cultural preference for the firstborn. By choosing a family of nomads to stand at the head of faith, God was exploding, overturning the world's culture of preference for the rich and the powerful. By choosing people of questionable character, God was overturning, exploding the world's preference for separating everyone into neat categories of good and bad. Here's the genius of God and the really good news. When you start from the bottom, when you work from the fringes, when you start with the forsaken of the world in order to develop who is in the family of God, you don't miss anyone. Everyone is chosen, everyone is loved, everyone is included in the heart of God, even you. Joe McCarthy was the manager of the New York Yankees back in some of their glory years of 1931 to 46. And uh, he once interviewed a coach that was being brought up from the farm system to be uh, an assistant, a coach on the, the bench for the Yankees. And he said to this guy, how much do you know about psychology? The coach said that he studied it some, read about it. So you think you're good, said McCarthy. The coach replied, I, I, I don't know how good I am, but it's a subject I've studied. All right said the manager, I'm going to give you a test. McCarthy said that a few years earlier, he'd had a problem and he'd gone to Frankie Corsetti, who was the shortstop of the team. Frank, he said, I'm not satisfied with the way Lou Gehrig is playing first base right now. He's gotten lackadaisical. I want you to help me. From now on, I want you to charge every ground ball. And when you catch it and pick it up, 
I want you to fire it to first base with all your might. I want you to knock the glove off of Lou Gehrig. And I don't care if you throw it wild from time to time. I want you to just knock him off the bag. Crosetti demurred and said, well, you know, maybe Lou won't like that. Who cares what Gehrig likes, McCarthy snapped. Just do what I tell you. Now McCarthy said to the coach, now that's the story. What conclusions do you draw from it? The coach considered the matter for a minute and then answered, I guess you were trying to wake up Lou Gehrig. See, McCarthy shrugged his shoulders in resignation. You have missed the point entirely. There wasn't a thing wrong with Gehrig. Crosetti was the one that was sleeping. I was trying to wake up Crosetti. The church has been missing the point entirely for entirely too long. God has not called us to point out other people's sin and lostness while being content with our own goodness and salvation. God calls us to focus our attention on others in order to wake us up to our mission of telling the good news to the world. We are too often lackadaisical, failing to cherish the truth of God's grace being for all. And by giving us a job to do, a commission to mission, we can't become complacent and smug about our privilege. It keeps us grateful for a grace that includes even us. And if God can include people like even us, us, then no one is excluded from the family of God. You see, we are all of us, Jacob and Esau, and we are all of us loved and blessed. Amen.